It is my privilege uh, to introduce you to our commencement speaker, uh, Dr. Richard Gertson. Uh, Rick is the senior pastor at Grace Bible Church in Hutchinson, Kansas, a role he has held since 1995. He earned his Bachelor of Arts in Theology from Southeastern Bible College and his Master of Divinity and Doctorate of Ministry from the Master's Seminary. He has served on the staff of five different churches in the states of Alabama, Louisiana, California, and Kansas. He's been involved in work overseas by teaching at Bible colleges and seminaries, leading pastoral and missionary training seminars, and ministering to church pastors in Brazil, Russia, and Africa. Please join me in welcoming my pastor, my friend, and my brother-in-law to the podium, Dr. Richard Gertson. I sat there thinking here on the stage just a minute ago that uh, I don't think any of the faculty at my, high, my college graduation would have ever thought that I would be addressing a, a college graduation, and I wish they were here so I could say, I told you. Actually, I never thought I would either, but to the board of Sterling College, the newly appointed President Rich, distinguished faculty and parents, as well as, of course, the Sterling College graduating class of 2013, it's my privilege to be here and address you this morning. You have quite an accomplishment that you have made. It's an honor to be with you this day, which ends years of perseverance and accomplishments on your behalf, things that you have done, things that you've gone through. Some of you have been able to do it in four or less years. Some of you have relished the time here in Sterling a little longer than that and have been here for a longer period of time. But while you've been here, you've learned. That's what colleges are for. You've learned academically in your respective disciplines, and you have learned through trials, through compressed time issues, through complicated circumstances. And you've learned through relationships with your family as it continues, as learned with relationships with your faculty. You've learned through forged friendships as well. And as you already know and have probably been going through a little bit of the emotion and definitely will be later today, college years are always remembered with great fondness. They always aren't the fondest times of your life, but they're always remembered with great fondness. I was never as poor as I've ever been when I was in college. I never worked as many jobs as I did when I was in college. But I look back with great, I, somehow I just remember all the fun stuff. And it's amazing how uh, the psyche of your mind works that way. Uh, some people call it repressive memories. I don't know, but that's part of it. It's a, it's a time of life when college brings you together, and it's a crucible in which your philosophies are forged. The last four or more years in your life, you have wrestled, thought through, got out the books, bantered with faculty, discussed with friends, and uh, shocked your parents with your philosophies that you have been working through and coming up with as you have been learning. He has been formative years, and they should be, because now you go on in your life. At this point, you now eagerly face and you now await the next. Whatever the next may be, from you it may be more education. You may have already enrolled and been accepted in grad school. Some of you may be going on to your careers. Some of you this summer will begin through marriage to form your family relationships and your own family unit yourself. It is the next, obviously, that I would like to address with you over the next few moments. I'd like to read to you a passage of Scripture in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15. Probably not your normal commencement passage. And then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, and it was the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to the deeds 
And the sea gave up their dead which were in it, death, and Hades gave up their dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, and this is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This passage obviously speaks of judgment at the end of time. I believe, in my understanding of Scripture, that there's two judgments, two basic judgments. One is the great white throne judgment that's covered in Revelation chapter 20. It will judge all the unsaved people, that is, those who do not claim Christ as their Savior through faith, and they will bring them and it will judge them, as we just read. Then there's the Bema Seat judgment. It judges the saved people, those who did, in fact, trust Jesus Christ with their life based on what He did on the cross, and they are rewarded for their work. The work that they've done in their life as done unto the Lord. Daniel helps us with this understanding of the judgment. He gives it to us in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. And I kept looking until the thrones were set up. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like a white snow. His, hair of, his head was like pure wool. His throne was blazing with flames. Its wheels were burning with fire. And a river of fire was flowing and coming from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. I love these great pictures of what goes on in heaven, whether it's Daniel 7 or Revelation 4 or Revelation 5, that gives us a glimpse into heaven and the grandeur and the majesty and the glory of God as he sits on the throne, whether it's with the 24 elders of Revelation or whether it's the description of Daniel chapter 7. They are somehow awe-inspiring doesn't cover it because it's amazing to think of our God. And yet, when we put that together with passages like 1 Corinthians 3 and 4 and 2 Corinthians 5 and Revelation 20, and we understand that the one who sits on the throne also is going to apply to our lives accountability. It's not just glorious and majestic. It's a little sobering. The judgment based in these judgments is, is based upon books. They open the books. The last week or so, we have been seeing uh, the possibilities of what technology and what government can do, whether it's looking into the AP or whether it's the IRS. And I don't care what you think about the standards. What, what we realize is they got a lot of information over there about us. And some people that's fine, and some people it's not fine. I, that's, my point is, is we, we live in an age where anonymity and being quiet in your life and nobody caring is less and less possible. And my point is, to you, it's never been possible. Because God has seen everything and He has been putting it in books. A written record. The thing about a written record is it's not arbitrary. The thing about a written record is it's not a subjective witness. It has been written down and recorded. Your human deeds from this day forward will be written down. Now, to be sure, this is not some Santa Claus naughty and nice list. Whether it is the great white throne because you have rejected Jesus Christ or, or the Bema seat because you have accepted Jesus Christ, what you do in this life is written down. And you, class of 2013, are going to give an account. You've just gone through final exams, right? In so many ways, college, that's judgment week, right? You are, you are judged upon, really, how you've conducted yourself for the last three or four months of the semester, whether you're diligent to do the work. And if you weren't, then judgment week is a, is a harder and, and a hotter week for you because you had to try to cram in a lot more work. And some of you who were diligent, it was a little bit easier. But nonetheless, it's judgment week as you go in and finish the course week each week. It's that, that final exam. And then you write down. Judgment in our hearts and mind can bring us to two different things. We either rebel against the accountability of judgment or we embrace that accountability. And really, judgment is a time we look forward to. It's, it's encouragement. 
and how you face the judgment at the end of your life can be encouraging to you. Judgment doesn't have to be gloom and doom and scary and who knows and apocalyptic. And Judgment can be exciting. First of all, you need to be sure of your belief in Jesus Christ. And then you know which judgment you're going to. That's encouraging. And secondly, you want to make sure that your life from now on, and hopefully it has until this point, is one that is a God-glorifying conduct of your life. You have just completed an important milestone. And you look forward to everything, right? Life is before you. It's exciting. And, and yeah, you understand trials, but because of your outlook on life, because you've completed this more, uh, milestone, the career, the further education, what looks ahead, family, all those things, the joys of life are what we're focusing on and what we should focus on because the joys of life will always outcome the sadnesses of life. But the reality is if you're living for Jesus Christ, the glory of being before the throne and having him said well done is the greatest encouragement you could ever hear. The thing to me about every moment is watched and written down and that I'm accountable is exciting. All, everything will be measured against the holy standard of a righteous God. Back in Leviticus, and it's repeated back in 1 Peter, we are commanded to be consecrate ourselves and be holy for, for I am holy. God calls us to that. And I think that's an encouraging call. No man is saved by his works. But you are judged by the works as a result of your salvation. We know that nobody can keep the law of God, and therefore we we rely on the work of Christ in Titus 3.5. It's not based on deeds that we have done in righteousness, but rather on the work of Jesus Christ. And we understand that God has instructed us to live in, in, in godliness. Therefore, we should deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and desires and live sensibly and righteously in the godly present age of 2000 or 10 Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 13. I believe that the faculty have done their job as represented by the fact that you actually walked. Okay? I believe you have done your job by the fact that you're going to walk across the stage. And I believe that the faculty and the staff who have poured their lives into helping you get through your education, your moms and dads who have encouraged and helped and supported in every way that they can, can send you out today knowing that your life ahead of you is encouragement. But I want you to live to the grand encouragement at the end of time. Strive to live to glorify God. Do all that you can. See, that is the blessed hope. The blessed hope. And the blessed hope is standing before Jesus after he has returned as our Savior and listen to him recount the deeds that we have done to Jesus' glory and his honor. And then your life will have meant something that is incredible. Your life over the next 50 or 60 years are a chance for you to live righteously and godly in this present age. And living righteously and godly will bring your life the attendant joys. And if you're living righteously and godly, James tells you that even the trials are joys. This accountability is meant for you to embrace it and to live toward the encouraging time when you stand before God and have him say, oh, well done. Your life is going to mean something then. You can continue on with your education and you can continue on with your careers. But at this point, this turning point in your life where you, are, where you are in a sense being sent out with a purpose. If you want your life to really mean something, not just for the next 50 or 60 years, but for all of the grand eternity, you will embrace the encouragement of the accountability at the judgment of God. You see, your life means something if it means something for the Savior. I want to encourage you to do that. My greatest congratulations. It's my joy to have some of you in class. And what an accomplishment you have made. Thank you very much.